Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our global participants. Welcome to this high level round table on the impact of livestock research on sustainable development. Looking back to accelerate future food system transformation, much of which is documented in a recently released 700 page book, you can see it here, to be formally launched next month. Our aim in today's roundtable is to get you excited and impressed by the results of the investment in livestock research for development and to explore how to build on that for the future. We're really pleased that you've joined us. My name is Shirley Tarawali. I'm Assistant Director General at ILRI, and I'll be moderating the opening session and the closing session that will look into the future in the closing session. And in between, we will have two other panels that will explore the impacts of over four decades of livestock research. The first, exploring what livestock research has delivered, and the second, getting into some of those wider development impacts. Before we get into that, the real stuff of it, let me just give you four tech tips. Put your full name and organization in your Zoom. You'll see some questions and comments in the chat as we go through today's session. Please feel free to join that conversation. This session is being recorded. The audio, the video, and the chat. And if you have a private chat, that will be seen by the organizers. If you find you have a problem, you can't see, you can't hear, close your Zoom, restart, and also close your other programs. Before we really get going, let me acknowledge the presence of officials from ILRI's two host countries, State Minister Regasu Fikra from Ethiopia and the PS for Livestock, Harry Kimtai from Kenya. First, we're really pleased that ILRI patron and Nobel Prize laureate, Professor Peter Doherty, has shared with us a video message to get us underway. Welcome to this online roundtable on the impact of livestock research on sustainable development. This is an enormously important topic that's very close to my heart. My name's Peter Doherty. I'm trained originally as a veterinarian and then due to various circumstances, made my reputation in basic immunology research and was awarded a Nobel Prize for that. But among the achievements that I regard as particularly significant are serving for a significant time, I think for two terms, on the board of what was the ILRAD laboratory in Nairobi, which is now, of course, ILRI, combining with the ILCA laboratory that was in Addis Ababa. That was a wonderful experience, coming to Nairobi regularly, working with colleagues from across the world, including many wonderful colleagues from Africa, and experiencing what was required to help people and to help sustainable societies exist in that type of context. It's impossible to be in Africa without realizing the enormous importance of livestock in so many aspects of culture and development and food resource for the people. ILRAD was a laboratory and that is to some extent built in to the ILRI model. It did a wonderful job, I believe, in building capacity in molecular science in Africa. Its scientists from many African countries and from Europe and America went back eventually to various institutions where they established very strong programs and have had a very significant influence on the progress of, of livestock research in general. The various problems that ILRAD tackled, in some senses they were too difficult, trypanosomiasis and thylariosis, and they couldn't readily be solved uh, using the types of approaches that were used initially. But the Institute evolved. It evolved 
to follow different lines, genetic lines, for instance, looking at livestock uh, resources. And it has evolved further to take a somewhat broader remit. These are enormously important institutions supported by the CGIAR network. They depend on the generosity of donor and donor nations, and they are a wonderful investment for our future as human beings across this diverse and wonderful planet. I think building capacity in Africa, there can't be anything more important or anything that should be closer to our motives. Thank you. Thank you. What a great start. We're really grateful that Peter took the time to record and send that message to us. Now, before we get into the panel discussions, we will hear some opening remarks. We have three speakers in this section. Uh, let me introduce them all together, uh, and then we'll hear from each of them in turn. Really pleased to welcome Jonathan Wadsworth, who is the lead agriculture specialist at the World Bank and principal advisor to the chair of the CGIR System Council. Welcome, Jonathan. We also have online the current ILRI board chair, Elsa Morano, who is associate vice chancellor, strategic Ac academic initiatives at Texas A&M University, agriculture and life sciences. And we have Jimmy Smith, ILRI director general, who's joining us today from Ethiopia, from Ilri's campus in Ethiopia. So let's begin with Jonathan. Jonathan, please go ahead. Thank you very much and welcome to everybody. On behalf of Jürgen Vogeli, I'd like to welcome everybody who's participating to this highly topical and I think very timely round table on the impact of livestock research on sustainable development. Looking back to accelerate future food system transformation. It's going to be an exciting round table, I'm very sure. Jürgen sent his apologies and asked me to thank Jimmy and Elsa for the invitation and for also asking the bank to co-host. It's an honor and it's a privilege for me personally to represent the bank and even more personally, uh, it's a huge pleasure to revisit my livestock roots and friends. Livestock, as probably everybody knows on this call, is a fundamental part of the global food system. Livestock contributes 40% of the global value of agricultural output, and some 1.3 billion people depend directly on animals for their livelihoods and nutrition security. Livestock's multiple roles are especially important for poor farming households and communities. So this book launch today is really timely. It's an honest and detailed examination of 45 years worth of research efforts. And it provides valuable lessons on which to base future actions. This is really important at this moment in time. It doesn't shy away from addressing failures and mistakes. And it helps understand the contradiction between research with strong scientific impact, yet only weak development impact, which is ultimately the primary concern of donors and investors. It explains how context matters. The livestock revolution, as predicted by Chris Delgado and colleagues, is happening. Increasing affluence, changing diets and population growth have made livestock one of the fastest growing agricultural sectors in middle and low income countries. So it's therefore not surprising that requests for World Bank support to livestock have increased almost fivefold over the past decade, with currently 1.9 billion invested in active livestock projects. However, investment in livestock is not without its critics. Currently, the livestock sector accounts for 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and the bank is committed to finding ways of reducing the carbon footprint of livestock by ensuring mitigation, and adaptation measures are built into operations from the very start. Fortunately, researching collaboration with CGIR 
has been fundamental in developing methods to quantify, measure, and track climate core benefits across all the bank's lending portfolio, currently running at over 60% for livestock projects. Changes in context inevitably affect changes in opportunities and priorities. CGIR centres were established in the Green Revolution era, or post-Green Revolution era in that period of change, which is believed to have saved the lives of a billion people. That was a third of the world's population at the time. This context simplified priority setting. Food supply was all important. And it was interesting to read in the book that ILRAD was founded on just two priorities, East Coast fever and trypanomyosis, which in the words of the book, simplified the definition of research. Fast forward to today, and we find ourselves dealing with many more issues and priorities. We have 17 interacting SDGs, and all of them are priorities. Complexity makes it hard to prioritize. But let's not confuse priority with urgency. Some priorities are more urgent than others, and context matters more than ever. Our new context is defined by climate change and has a name, the Anthropocene Epoch. Quite simply, if we don't urgently get a grip on climate change, many other priorities will quickly become redundant. Livestock production is a major component of a global food and agriculture system and also has great potential to deliver a triple win of increased productivity, reduced emissions and carbon sequestration. We must address livestock from a broader perspective than before. It's not just about live weight gain or milk per cow anymore. The global context has changed and so must our approaches to research, development and innovation. One excellent example is a programme involving several research teams, including the CGIR Livestock Programme and investors, including the World Bank, which has shown how livestock can achieve that triple win at landscape scale. This is the Columbia Mainstreaming Sustainable Cattle Ranching Project, which converted 30, 32,000 hectares of degraded land to silver pastoral systems. Not only did milk yields increase, but sustainable stocking rates also went up and costs of production went down. At the same time, over a million tonnes of CO2 equivalent were captured and biodiversity was improved. That was a pilot programme on 32,000 hectares, but just illustrates the potential for livestock to become a big part of the solution rather than constantly being criticised as a big part of the problem. In closing, I'd like to quote from the next to last page of the book. I didn't read all the book, but I managed to get to the last chapter, which was absolutely fascinating. In considering the future and how Ilri will adapt to the new one CGIR context, Jimmy Smith and his colleagues write, research programs and projects are increasingly being conceptualized by starting with the end in mind. This means we start by identifying the development challenge we want to meet, the impact we want to make, where and on whom. Then we work back to what outcomes are required to achieve this, what research outputs are needed to produce those outcomes, and what research activities and resources are needed to produce these outputs. I could find no better words to kick off this round table and hope that net zero carbon livestock is prom prominently on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Fantastic introduction. And yes, we are really pleased to have the chance to co-host with the World Bank. Thanks to you, to Jürgen and your colleagues for all the support. Let me now invite Elsa Murano to give her opening remarks. Elsa, you're there? I am. Well, hello, everyone, and um, thank you, uh, Dr. Tarawali, for this opportunity and your leadership at Elri. Uh, 
And Jonathan, thank you for your very inspirational words, sir. And thank you especially for the support that the World Bank has provided ILRI and the CGIAR as a whole over the years, actually. In fact, uh, you may know that the first CGIAR secretariat was hosted by the World Bank, uh, showing the great commitment that the bank has for the application of science for the betterment of people across the world. Well, the book that is the focus of our discussions today is obviously about the impacts that ILRI has made as one of the leading livestock research institute, if not the leading livestock research institute in the world. But let us realize that it is also about the systems-wide approach that the CGIR represents. In fact, uh, several CGIR centers have played specific roles in advancing the science of livestock, not just ILRI, having been involved in developing approaches that have helped integrate livestock, crops, and civil pastoral systems. Well, this book demonstrates how investments made by the donor community in agricultural research and development help us to see beyond short-term horizons, truly making a difference in the long-term. In fact, a recent study on the impact of the $60 billion investment that donors have made in the CGIAR over the past 50 years has returned a tenfold benefit, 10 to one. Well, I would like to point out that this year also marks the 50th anniversary of the CGIAR. So the timing of the publishing of this book is perfect. As all of you know, the CGIAR had its start from the Green Revolution, as was mentioned, uh, which certainly is a science-based movement, which the great Dr. Norman Borlaug was a key part of. And those of us who knew him personally um, continue to be amazed at his impact. It has focused on developing solutions to important challenges. Uh, now, of course, in the 21st century, including those that have been posed by the interconnectedness of health, environment, and social inclusion. Well, to meet these and other challenges, the CGIR's mission is committed to deliver science-based solutions through innovations that will help transform food, land, and water systems, especially now, given the climate crisis that we're experiencing. Well, my own research and policy career has focused on food safety. So I'm excited to, to hear uh, Dr. Delia Grace uh, today. And I am very pleased to see how ILRI has elevated the topic of food safety to a central position within the CGIR agenda. In fact, we see food safety in at least two of the proposed one CGIR research initiatives, the one-on-one -on -one health, as well as sustainable urban and peri-urban agri-food systems. In addition, the work of ILRI is also part of many of the other CGIR research initiatives, including the one that focuses on livestock climate and systems resilience, and another one on the role of livestock on livelihoods and nutrition. Well, all of these programs show the integrated nature of the research conducted by CGIR centers, which has transitioned from a sole focus on crops and commodities, which was the tradition, to tackling important development challenges that impact health through a systems approach. It is the type of research conducted by ILRI actually and other centers that is encapsulated in the new 1CGIR research strategy and organizational structure. The 1CGIR is a dynamic reformulation of the CGIR's partnerships, the knowledge base, the assets, the global presence with the goal of enhancing integration and impacts in the face of the interdependent challenges that I mentioned, which are facing our world. Well, as chair of the Board of Trustees of ILRI, I am extremely proud of the work conducted by our scientists. And so I'm very excited about this book. I'm also very interested to hear from key development stakeholders about the impacts that livestock research has had and where the challenges posed by food, nutrition, health, climate and equity lie. So with all these comments made, I want to thank you again, Dr. Tarawali, um, and uh, I will give it back to you. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Elsa, and for your leadership from the top of the board there. Let's conclude this opening segment by hearing from Jimmy. 
Jimmy Smith, Director General. I hope he's there. Yes, great. Thank you, Shirley. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me join others in expressing my appreciation to all who have joined today for their interest and participation. Over the past 18 years, the international community invested more than $1.8 billion in global livestock research. Not all of it to ILRI, but most of it. Some also went to ICARTA and to SIA. This book helps to highlight how that funding was spent and the impact it has had on development, our science contribution, and building research capacity of professionals and institutions. It is incumbent on me to thank all those donors, past and present, for their support, without which the work embodied in this book could not have been accomplished. The book reviews 45 years, 1973 to 2018, of major achievements lessons learned, impacts generated by the International Livestock Research Institute and its two pre predecessors, the International Livestock Center for Africa and the International Laboratory for Research on Animal Diseases. And of course, our many partners. Some have been critical about why spend time on publishing this book. I've been asked many times, why spend the time recounting the past when we should be focusing on the future? Well, for us, this book attempts some measure of accountability to our donors who made these investments. It also is an attempt to demonstrate and differentiate the impacts of livestock research, which are far more diffuse than perhaps our crop, crop counterparts, where a single variety, a new variety of rice or maize can make a big impact. It is a compilation to facilitate access to the findings and therefore an effort to get these findings into wider use. It will also allow us to look at the future, not reinvent the wheel, but build on the research accomplishments of the past. ILRI has expanded from its original focus in Africa of its two predecessors, and now have offices across South and Southeast Asia and Africa. We're indebted to the two host institutions which host our headquarters in Kenya and Ethiopia. Let me give way to the panels that Shirley referred to, to explore the subjects of livestock and its impacts. But it would be remiss of me if I did so before acknowledging the contributions of previous board chairs and members and previous director generals. It would also be remiss of me if I did not recognize as well the many contributors to this book, all the contributing authors, and in particular the lead editors of John McIntyre and Delia Grace Randolph and co-editors, Susan Macmillan. Susan Macmillan and others at Hillary who have done so. So let me turn it back to Shirley with a big thank you to all of you for joining. I will come back at the end of it to attempt a brief wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you, Jonathan. You've set the scene really well for what I'm sure will be a really stimulating series of discussions. To start that off, I'm really pleased to invite Brian Perry to introduce and moderate the first panel, which will be looking at what have been the impacts of livestock research. Ilri Emeritus Fellow, Brian, has 50 years of experience seeking solutions to improve health and well-being of livestock and the systems they inhabit in lower middle income countries. He led epidemiology research at ILRI for some 20 years and latterly has had several engagements with the UN and bilateral funding agencies, as well as holding honorary professorships from Oxford and Edinburgh universities. I think with that, the panel will not get away lightly. So Brian, that's over to you. 
Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. I do hope you can hear me well, and it is indeed a pleasure to be asked to, uh, to coordinate this discussion. And Shirley, thank you very much. Jimmy, uh, also, thank you very much for your introductory words. Uh, I'm going to, uh, we've got three people on this panel. It would be nice to, we can, we can see them. We've got John McIntyre uh, to start with, and John McIntyre, uh, who I will say a few more words about in a minute. We've got Michael Peters, uh, Michael Peters uh, from the, particularly from the foragers side, uh, and, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about them when I ask them some specific questions. And we have Delia Grace, Delia Grace. Delia Grace Randolph, who is has just moved from uh, uh, out of Africa uh, to, um, to to the United Kingdom. So let me start off with uh, with, with with John. John uh, John McIntyre involved uh, for he said for he says many many years. John, you have come from uh, you've been involved in research so you you have a background in the CG system so you've seen the system side of it you've been involved in IFPRI, ICRISAT uh, and ILRI you I think you were a, a director of research at ILRI. also at the country level you had uh, Mexico, Bangladesh, Cote d'Ivoire and other countries on the ground with World Bank and other for you. so you a broad comment on this research impact uh, what is the relevance across CG system and across the countries you've done? How relevant is this book that you have done a fantastic job in leading the editing of? How relevant is it to the uh, both the systems that you've been with and also the countries that you have worked in? Uh, thank you, Brian. The book is most relevant for uh, defining the kinds of priorities for the future based upon what has and what has not worked in the past. If we look at the beginning of ILCA and ILRAD uh, half a century ago, uh, doc systems mainly in Africa, but also in Central Asia and Latin America uh, were not terribly well understood and were often understood through the filter of uh, what I should call colonial biases in understanding of how these systems work and what their objectives were and what their constraints were. Uh, at, the, at the same time, the work that has been done has uh, rejected uh, possible solutions, notably the uh, uh, the vaccine solutions for trypanosomiasis uh, to, to a lesser extent East Coast fever. Uh, and it has created a much greater understanding of the rationale uh, and efficiency of extensive pastoral systems and of the role of livestock and mixed farming systems. That is where mixed farming systems being those where crops and livestock are held on the same enterprise. Notably through the provision of notably through the provision of soil fertility inputs, uh, power, uh, and savings investment vehicles for small farmers. So your the bottom line, which is a very nice clear statement, John. You're saying that impact assessment has been the one of the key measures that has that has helped. So tell me, how do you uh, when you look back, uh, uh, Phil Thornton? Uh, who may be involved in this meeting, he uh, did uh, an impact assessment of the, the roles of ILCA and ILRI, uh, ILRAD between 1975 and 1998. He looked at adoption, economic impact, social environmental impact, and the methodology of tools. Does this, how does his assessment then done, and he was he, he was appointed as the, the sort of impact assessment person. How does that approach uh, differ? How has yours built on that approach and added to it? Thornton and Era work was published in about 1998 and covered uh, what at the time were uh, existing impact studies done uh, under the leadership of ILCA and ILRAD and then for a brief time when ILRI was created in early in 1995. Uh, it focused on trypanosomiasis control, uh, largely through the, through the use of drugs, not through the use of vaccine, uh, obviously, and land management, uh, soil fertility, other animal health issues. Uh, tree forage was a notable area where, where Thornton worked himself personally on impact. Um, so 
that work covered roughly the first half of the three institutions, the first half of their existence since about 1970. And what we have done is updated the existing studies, the studies that panned out uh, with real impact as compiled by Thornton and Odero, uh, and brought them up to date with a more extensive literature review uh, you know, based on, on work you know, that was uh, it, that has evolved since the first half of the two institutions uh, and then carried out in the second half uh, in the existence of Ilry. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so it's an updating, but I think it's a little bit more than that. But uh, now, um, so some comment earlier on was about the reason for this book, which is partly a, a big thank you to the donors. It's accountability. And, and documentation. But my question now to changing to Delia. Delia, you, in your background, you are uh, an epidemiologist. You've been an epidemiologist for, uh, for, for many years uh, in, the, in the field of working at, at Ilry. You are also specialized in blogs and things like this. How, what is gonna, how is the, when is the Hello Magazine version of this coming out to tell the public? Uh, and putting it in terms that the public will understand uh, what has been the impact of this institution. Well, livestock are beautiful and should be on the cover of every glossy magazine. I must say, we have a really great comms team at, at Ilry. I think comms are very good in the CGIR. My joint, my new joint institute here, one of the first things they said, which is a university in England, said how much they admire the CGIR for their communications. And that, that was nice to hear. It's out there. You, there'll be videos, blogs, infographics, uh, articles and papers. If you want to hear good things about livestock, just just Google Ilry and us. OK, well, sticking with you, Tia, thank you for that. And that's a very good uh, you. Uh, a lot of people in, will endorse that. You have uh, you are uh, an epidemiologist and you have evolved uh, into food systems or you have transformed and become attracted to food systems. Uh, what is this for what reason? Is this your personal interest? Is it the, the funding interest or is it the driver uh, of the priorities that you've had to deal with? Yes, I mean, I, I Brian is a vet too, of course, and I have strayed from the fold because vets <laughs> like to work in zoonosis and especially wildlife if they get the chance. And here am I working with... Um, sausages which have gone off and are sold in informal markets. I must say it wasn't something I immediately was interested in. My first love and still a passion of mine is community animal health. Uh, but having worked in food safety for, for the last 15 years, it's become increasingly clear that this matters. This matters to a lot of people. Uh, every, many people consume livestock, livestock products. Fewer people are farmers. I think it's a part of the transformation for, of the CGIR. We've moved off the farm and down, down towards the plate. And that's where we should be because we've realized how important issues around nutrition are, the impacts of stunting, the potential that animal source foods could have to, to, to reverse some of the greatest challenges facing the planet, which, which are around nutrition and especially child health. So it's an area where I think, which I think is very exciting, which is very new very important. It's also a kind of a low hanging fruit. We've done so much work on the farms over the decades. We, we've done a lot of the easy things. We've done so little work on the consumer's plate and in the informal markets where most people buy their food uh, and where the impact of foodborne disease is comparable to that of malaria, HIV AIDS or TB, but the investments in the control of foodborne disease is less than a hundredth of the investments in any of those. So the economists will probably tell us that that is not a good thing. Okay, well, thank you. Well, you heard from the board chair that, that, that there is a delight that you've moved, that moved into that. Let me turn to Michael Peters. Uh, my, my, Michael Peters, you've, uh, your, your, your background is very much, you're 30 years in the area of tropical forages and, 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 uh, and livestock crop systems working in Latin America, in West Africa, and to a certain extent in, in, in East Africa, and, and very much, but a lot of your work relating to, uh, it, to, to, to CIAT, uh, the International Center for, for, for Tropical Agriculture. How, 
uh, how well has that uh, the forages and the feed systems been integrated into the, the livestock side of it under the uh, CGIR research? I, I, thanks, Brian. I think quite well, particularly through the and more integration through the uh, recent CRP, and I hope uh, that will continue into the one CGIAR. While uh, forages and feeds uh, and feeds are important for animal production, it always can uh, only go if you have the animal genetics and the animal health with it, and obviously the whole. Uh, Context with this, and by the way, I started with with Ilka and then later Ilri. Well, that's okay. all for now. But feed, uh, but feed somehow seems to, if I'm being impertinent, a little bit of a late arrival on the scene in terms of in terms of Ilri's concern. I mean, I did a study in in in, uh, in the Horn of Africa recently when we were looking at. Uh, at, at trade issues and and quality of and disease of trade it wasn't the, the disease wasn't the issue the priority were the feed to get animals to a, a quality that the they would be competitive with other products emerging from other parts of the world is it a is it a late comer and has it been a, 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 a underfunded and, and but has that all been corrected um i I think in, in terms of forage research, there had been a lot in Latin America and a lot of, of impact. And in terms of uh, ill research, research, basically in, in Asia and Africa, there also had been quite a bit of investment uh, in the past. However, uh, uh, while there had been quite impacts on, on the more the feed sites, crop residual work and so on, work on forages to get impact i think is only coming coming now in the in the recent years and i think that has to do because the whole context is changing and definitely in eastern africa uh, forages are dramatically taking up with probably fourfold increase in seed sales over the last two years including the time of covid and I made a quick calculation before this meeting, probably this year, about 20, 30 tons of seed are going to be sold in East Africa of improved forages. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, John, you, you are going to make a comment. Yes, Brian, with respect to forages, I think one of the, uh, if you will, the original sins of Ilka long ago was not to have done much on forages for the first decade of its, of its existence. It didn't have a forage seed bank until about, 1983, uh, and it had basically adopted the model of, of ranching with oversown forages in the way it looked at African livestock systems. And this was, this was unfortunately quite a serious mistake. Uh, and second, they uh, neglected the, the role of, of crop residues, which are essentially a, a byproduct that becomes a planted forage. And their Ilka, Ilri didn't really do much uh, on crop residues until uh, the late 90s under the leadership of Ercole Zerbini and later by the, the late Michael Blumel in partnership with Icrasat and Hyderabad. So it's, it's this kind of reflection on the, the, the role of planted forages in smallholder systems. The, again, the, the adoption of a model from other areas of the world that's not necessarily well adapted to small farms in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and in a way, the, the late arrival for research on an important area, notably crop residues seen as a type of planted forage, that, that's, that are several of the important lessons you can see by looking back. Uh, if the objective is to continue the transformation of future agricultural systems involving animals. Yeah, maybe, okay, maybe. thank you, John, for and that. Have, Carry on. Michael. So, uh, because I didn't respond on the underfunding, but I don't want to uh, complain about the funding, especially as there are a lot of people who have supported uh, livestock here in the room and forages in particular. But if I compare it to uh, a crop like rice, which is e very conser conservative estimates is equal, equal to, to the importance of planted forages is, is, uh, is, is not a lot. And in terms of gross value, uh, planted forage is not livestock, is equal to, to uh, sweet potato and cassava combined. And so in that context, it is probably underfunded and probably not known 
the importance of uh, tropical forages. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so this this book, and you, I mean, I must emphasize the fantastic job, John, you've done uh, 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 and pulling it together and editing the determination and with Delia as input. So it's the documenting the research. How much has the environment changed that now uh, you're documenting uh, lots of pockets of, of, of science, some uh, chapters that are pulled multidisciplinary. How much has life changed that you now have to be looking at uh, theories of change in terms of where the science fits into development, who are your partners, and how you're going to uh, fund that to make sure that this science has actual impact on the ground. I know there's a session later on. How, how is life going to change to make sure that, that the proceeds of this, uh, uh, this research documentation is adequately uh, made use of? Well, you know, the, the important development is in the century in terms of ILRI's research and the context of ILRI's research is, of course, the problem of climate change. Now, every ILRI research project, indeed every project by every partner, has to consider the marginal carbon burden, if you will, of generated by technologies uh, produced by such research. And this was a problem that was not, I won't say, not just neglected in the first 25 to 30 years of the existence of this institution and its predecessors, but even denied as a problem. I mean, it was 1998, 1999 external review of ILRI that said, well, there's no point in working on climate at ILRI. Uh, and mercifully, this is this is a, a vision that's changed. And so, to me, this is the main change in the external context, and imposes a very different constraint on the kinds of research that Ilri does now today. I mean, after all, if it were possible to develop uh, a vaccine against trypanosomiasis after so many years of work, the question would have to be: Well, what would be the carbon effect of the induced land use and production changes uh, by such a vaccine? And the same question could be asked of, of practically every other line of research. Thank you very much, Delia. Would you like to comment on that relating to disease, the climate change and disease, uh, the, 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 the pluses and minuses that have just been, some of them have just been illustrated by John? Yes, I think there's actually a lot of similarities between the two. And by the way, the World Bank estimated that the cost of pandemics was comparable to the cost of climate change. And again, when we talk about underinvestment, there's been a lot more spent on climate change. That, that's a good thing. But there's been not much spent on pandemics. And we are seeing some of the results of it uh, and have done for, for the last year, year and a half. So that has been a shift. As you said, when, when we started, it was sort of very much looking at specific diseases which affected productivity. But when we look at the real cost of animal disease, and remember that 75% of human uh, emerging diseases come from animals, when we look at the real cost, of it is so much bigger than production. And in fact, production and productivity is only a very, very small part of it. Much bigger is the impact on human health, the impact on societies, the impact on economies, the impact on trade. I don't even have to tell you that. You, you've all lived that. We've all lived that. And that has, has been a shift. In fact, we were also told when I joined ILRI that looking at food safety by external evaluators, that looking at food safety and zoonosis was, was not where we should be focusing their people. Doctors look at people, your vets go and look at the animals. Uh, and that's now everybody is thinking about one health. We have to work together. We will never solve these wicked problems. We will never cure the planet, cure people, cure animals, unless we join hand in hand, human health, animal health, ecosystem health. And it's really good to see that being generally acknowledged now uh, across all of societies, across all of donors, and as Elsa said, being a, a, a lead initiative in the new one CGR, we have one health. Okay, thank you. That's covered a lot of ground there. This issue of, uh, of carbon neutrality uh, and, and, and livestock. Jonathan Wadsworth uh, added a little gem there at the end. Uh, to, to, to challenge you. Uh, re reactions from, from, from the feeds, from the health, from the, uh, from the livestock side, uh, the target, the, 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 the impact that that is going to have on livestock research. John, would you like to start? Yes, as, uh, I think I said previously, is that now every project done in this area of, of, of 
mixed life, crop livestock systems or extensive systems, whether it's vaccines, whether it's feeds and forages, whether it's water development, whether it's food safety or other aspects of animal health, has to consider uh, the, the marginal carbon effect. Uh, and this is a, a very tricky problem. A and uh, it, you know, it, it's something that there, it has to be part of the screening of every research project is that what is the additional greenhouse gas burden generated by uh, technologies produced by this research? And again, with focus on, on, on the important aspect of uh, would higher livestock productivity resulting from pasture development or from for from better animal health, would that lead to increased land use clearing, which in land use clearing is the biggest uh, carbon generation effect of animal production in the tropics. Okay, thank you. Can I pass to, to Michael on that, that same question, but also the balance with water, which we haven't mentioned. Uh, can you put, please give us a context from your uh, feeds and forages point of view? Yeah, I mean, there was uh, the big book, Livestock Long Shadow, and uh, just to, to put that greenhouse gases to, uh, together with water and with land degradation, livestock production is associated with the biggest negative environmental impacts on all of the three. But that uh, just means that that's also where it's likely the best way to find a solution. So which may be uh, different from what some people think. And uh, coming back to, 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 the, to the climate, and I think Jonathan already mentioned silvopastoral systems, but not only silvopastoral systems. Uh, in essence, in, in a very few words, uh, it is about reducing emissions and uh, balancing basically uh, uh, the, the whole carbon uh, with, uh, uh, with some measurements. So it can be genetic can be carbon sequestration. And I think we have demonstrated if you use uh, basically locally produced feed, you can have a carbon neutral up to carbon positive uh, uh, livestock production. Um, last words, uh, this is part of a uh, NAMA for Colombia, which Jonathan alerted yes, uh, to us. He did mention that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the, the last comment from Delia before we wrap up this session, please, Delia. Yes, just to, to finish on the health. Uh, of course, healthy animals uh, produce less emissions per kilogram of product. This has not been researched. We're looking towards the future now. We want to work on it. But quickly, carbon neutrality is important. It's not the only important thing in the world. Other things matter. Animal wealth, for example, beef, production gets a very bad rap. The single yeah. worst thing for animal welfare on the planet is broiler chickens. Beef, grass-fed beef is one of the best. If you care about climate, you will eat chickens. If you care about animal welfare and animal suffering, you might prefer beef. Delia, what an what a exciting note to finish on. Thank you very much for, uh, for that. I'm afraid I've got John has put his hand up, but I've got uh, Shirley uh, looking very anxious there at the at the desk, and I have to say a big looking thank at the you. Clock, Brian. <laughs> Sorry, looking at the clock. <laughs> yes, I know, but I want to say first of all, thank you very much indeed, uh, Delia, uh, Michael, and John for your stimulating comments, and and and, and thank you uh, for being part of this, and and uh, and thank you, Ilri, for inviting me to uh, to engage in this discussion with such distinguished people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brian. And let me add my thanks to Delia and Michael and John as well, highlighting some of the achievements of livestock research, but also stressing as we go into the future, we've got to connect what has come out of that wealth of the past. Now, we want to explore a bit what that research has meant on the ground. And I'm really pleased to welcome Umuliza Muthoni and Jiro who worked in that communications team you heard mentioned for ILRI for a number of years, but Mothoni's moved on. She's now communications policy and advocacy lead for Africa with the Rockefeller Foundation. She's got a great panel lined up for us here. So Mothoni, please come up, over to you. Thank you, Shirley, for those welcoming remarks. It's exciting to be back, especially now during this launch of this comprehensive book. 
to echo the panelists of the past session, livestock systems don't exist in a vacuum. Collectively with other actors in the ecosystem, guess this particular round table will focus on development impacts. You will hear why livestock research matters. Through, reflec through reflections of my esteemed panelists, you will see how livestock research has impact across the continent, across the globe, and it has various and impactful strides that it has made. You will listen to specific sectorial gaps and lessons learned. Finally, you will hear the opportunities and challenges we foresee in the coming years. To achieve this, we've brought together leading representatives from donor agencies, governments and regional research organizations, other development organizations, which I would like to introduce right now. So with great honor, I would like to introduce my panelists. I would like to first introduce Dr. Fikru Regasa, State Minister, Ministry, Minister of Agriculture for Ethiopia. Secondly, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nick Nwakwapa, Acting Director, Director General, Africa Union, Pan-African Veterinary Vaccine Center, and Acting Director General, AUIBA. Third, I'd like to welcome Dr. Rob Bergen, Chief Scientist, USAID Bureau of Resilience and Food Security. I would also like to welcome Dr. Trugon Tuyet Maya, Vice Director, National Institution of Nutrition, Vietnam. And then I would also like to welcome my final panelist, Ariana Guglielmodori from the World Farmers Organization. Welcome panelists. Kindly panelists, yeah. I'd like everybody to get to know you a bit better. So one minute each, I'd like to ask you to please share how livestock for development research has been close to your heart and why. So we'll start with you, Dr. Regessa. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, of course, <laughs> yeah, Niru. Uh, of course, uh, the first thing is livestock is uh, really our life, our food, our company uh, and friends. So uh, ILRI is one of the leading international institution. Uh, of course, it started with ILCA and it helped us uh, to really develop uh, the livestock sector in Ethiopia, and, and it's really uh, with passion that we were working with Italy. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Next, Dr. Mkwapa. Sorry, sorry, I think you're muted. Yes, good afternoon, all. And sorry, I presented such a difficult name for you to present. Yes. <laughs> I've been working uh, in the livestock sector now for over 30 years. I started, of course, uh, that is where you see my passion coming from. I started from the National Veterinary Research Institute, VOM, uh, in Nigeria, uh, where I rose to the rank of director before coming to the African Union in 2010 as the chief veterinary vaccine officer. And I've remained there until uh, 2015, when I became the director, and finally they appointed me as acting director here. Livestock is very close to my heart. I love uh, livestock, even though, as they say, we have to eat our patients sometime, but we do everything to protect them, to make sure we get uh, a good uh, source of livelihoods and also good source of meat from them. And uh, as uh, pertains Ilri, Everyone knows Ilri has been supporting livestock research and have been doing a tremendous uh, uh, amount of activity in the livestock sector. We have had to collaborate with uh, Ilri on a number of occasions, both in the vaccine side, in the 
health side and also here at IBA, I've uh, seen a number of projects dealing with coordination involving ILRI. So ILRI is a great partner to be within the livestock sector. Thank you. Thank you for that. And your, your name is not difficult. It's me who's struggling. <laughs> All right, next, um, Dr. Bertrand. Thank you, Umaliza, and it's great to be part of this panel today. And I have to say, it was wonderful hearing the opening panel trace the arc of that 50 years of livestock research. And um, I think it was, I, it was clear that livestock were always important, but I think over time we've added to that in terms of our understanding of why we invest in livestock research. And I think this is true in USAID and probably other investing donor partners as well. So for example, we've learned so much about the role of animal source foods around things like child nutrition and growth and reduction in child stunting. We've learned a lot about the role of gender uh, in terms of generating income that gets uh, used very wisely in the household and in the community. So I think nowadays when we think about livestock research, we're thinking about it as essential for our poverty reduction goals. We're thinking about it as essential for our nutrition goals. And then very importantly, as we also heard from the opening panel, uh, the climate change challenge uh, has, has, is looming large. And yet we also heard that you know, we have global challenges, but we have very differing local contexts. And I think it's going to be some of those that are going to emerge as we link that climate challenge to those other human challenges around uh, uh, poverty reduction, nutrition and growth, and, and, and environmental sustainability uh, uh, going forward through, through that systems approach that was also mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those sentiments. Um, Dr. Meyer, please go next. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Samita uh, Digital. Yeah. My name is uh, Chung Tut Mai. I am the medical doctor, also the nutritionist. So, this, uh, in my institute of uh, nutrition, uh, belong to the Minichi of Health. Yeah. So, uh, for the related with the livestock in the Vietnam, so uh, my institute is uh, for the research, uh, research on foc uh, focus on the uh, food safety testing and uh, for the nutrition for the human. So, but uh, that's why, uh, that's why I know, yeah, you know, in the we have uh, many projects with related with the uh, how to uh, improving the nutrition for the Vietnamese people. Of course, I think the livestock is uh, very related with the, um, our resource. So in the um, uh, in the last five years, we have a, a big uh, research to talk about the um, antibiotic in the Vietnamese big product. So I think that's why I uh, I can hear to would like to share with you with some information about the uh, nutrition and the uh, uh, livestock in the Vietnam. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, lastly, but of course, more importantly, <laughs> Ariana, please. Thank you, Umaliza. Well, I am surrounded by eminent scientists, but I'm here to bring the farmers' voices. So if your question is why does livestock matter to us, we are those people, those families uh, uh, that are running the business in the livestock sector. So for us, livestock is our livelihoods, livestock is our business, but even much more than this, I really appreciate the fact that it was evoked that we're now more and more entering into systemic approach in the, to, to science within the livestock sector and more in general in approaching uh, the way we produce uh, and consume food. And for us, the farmers, uh, the livestock producers, livestock is also culture. Livestock is uh, a fundamental piece, a fundamental component of our communities. And uh, I'd love to evoke a final point on um, uh, climate. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said around uh, the, the opportunity of the livestock sector and not the threat of the livestock sector in the climate challenge. And finally, 
maybe we should talk more and uh, and collaborate more also on equity and uh, how much livestock can contribute to overcome some of the challenges related to nutrition and to poverty and to ending hunger. Thank you, over. All right, thank you for that. That's actually quite a great segue into my first question. So the book states that um, recent evidence suggests that the health burden of foodborne diseases is comparable to three major conditions, malaria, HIV, and AIDS, and tuberculosis. Most of the unsafe food burden is due to contaminated fresh food produced from informal markets. So Ariana, I have a twofold question for you. First, how has this impacted the livelihoods of farmer communities in in informal markets, especially with those dealing with animal source foods like milk, meat, and eggs? And the second part of my question is what is the shift that is needed in terms of the narrative for farmers to stop being end users and to get at the forefront? Please, Ariana. Thank you, Melissa. Um, let me combine the two questions that are posing, that you are bringing to the table um, right now, because you know the only way to provide a meaningful answer and a relevant answer to the first part of your question is to face the second part, which is to say, we as farmers, we feel the need not to be considered as targets of solutions emerging from scientific activity, from the research work. Uh, we feel the urgency of being considered as partners by the research board. Um, at WFO, the World Farmers Organizations, which represents um, more than 75 farmers uh, associations from more than 60 countries in the world, we uh, pledge we pledge for a farmer driven approach to innovation uh, i we don't pretend to have all the answers and all the solutions but for sure by getting nearer by getting closer to the farmers communities to their families to their needs uh, it would be possible to highlight some of the threats some of the challenges that they have to face to, to, to be able to cope, for instance, with food safety at the farm level. And these challenges that need answers from the scientific world uh, are particularly relevant when it comes to smallholders, to the most vulnerable in the farming world. That's why uh, I could tell you that for sure, farmers can do more. That's always true. We can improve, we can do better. But I won't tell you this. I will tell you that we need to work closer, closely together, science and farmers and their organizations to make sure that we are providing the right answers. Answers that are not only working perfectly from the scientific point of view, but they make sense when they go down, they go down from the science to the real life world, including coping with uh, the, the reality that is sometimes very harsh and very tough to face. For instance, uh, uh, there's a lot to be done when it comes to improving infrastructures so that the smallholders can be able to, to better manage food safety issues. And those infrastructures are something that the farmers can do almost nothing uh, about. Thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Maya. Um, with your work that you did on the uh, Safe uh, Pork Project in Vietnam, could you share some insights around food safety, more so around uh, consumer-led approaches, um, exp exp especially around the fact that in Vietnam, um, there's a high demand for animal um, source foods? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Umuniza. Yeah. So um, I think I think uh, I would like to introduce some in the, the situation the food safety in the Vietnam. So in the Vietnam in the over the past ten years, the government we have developed in the law of the food safety and the last strategy on food safety and last strategy on nutrition. So I think the issue in the food safety has in the Vietnam has been significant improving. 
uh, for example, is reducing the number of the boy um, shortening uh, and the ensure the safety uh, for the, I think the almost the first product. So, but I think in the, um, uh, in the Vietnam still uh, um, exists the um, many problem for the food, um, uh, uh, food safety, for example, is the biological uh, contamination and the um, residue uh, substance. Um, I, I, I would like to have uh, so use some, uh, for example, in the Vietnam now, um, uh, have from uh, some research, we, we call in the uh, uh, symbol of the cattle and pouchy with the DZ coaching in the micro uh, uh, biological contamination is uh, uh, around the 25%. So I think another problem we have uh, facing now is for the antibiotic using in the farm. Yeah, so uh, in the Vietnam, do you know in the, in the last 10 years, the Vietnam economy uh, and the population is uh, growing uh, rapidly so production and the consumption of the animal products as increasing uh, very fast. Uh, so now in the last ten year, uh, last year in the we have a uh, uh, last uh, nutrition survey. Uh, we saw that in the uh, um, dietary intake of the animal product. So now increasing by year. So for example, is the eat, eating for for meat uh, around the one hundred uh, fifty gram. Uh, per person uh, per day. Yes, yeah, so I think it's very quickly in the increasing for the consumption. So um, to the many, the big, the dizzy, and the increasing meat, the product, uh, farmer, and um, uh, as a turning to the antibiotic and other antimicrobial uh, creating in the uh, zootic uh, dizzy and the resistant uh, to the uh, antibiotic drugs. So um, uh, I think in the, uh, the like, sorry, yeah, sorry mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I think it's the the same another uh, country. Yeah. So um, I would like to forget to some um, to talk about the project uh, of health and the antibiotic of the Vietnam Vietnamese big product um, uh, from the last uh, last three year funded by the Danila. So we have a cooperation with the uh, University of Copenhagen and the National Institute of the Veterinary uh, Research and the National Institute of Nutrition and the URI is a very uh, big uh, project. So we have done now. So I think it's uh, after uh, Philip's uh, project, we have uh, two uh, thousands. Um, uh, so uh, we, we can um, establish this one health approach to uh, to map and the many driver to antibiotic use and the antibiotic resistant approach in the Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So I think in the very big problem, we, now we have a limitation of the OLH and the practice from the farmer, how to reducing uh, in the using for the antibiotic in the Vietnam. Yes, I think it's a very big problem. So I think in the uh, in the future, yeah, um, I think the next, next, uh, next time after finish the uh, research, we have to continue to how to for the communication and the, to training for the whole the farmer to how to reduce uh, the using the antibiotic for in the um, uh, big product. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 I would like to share with you to some information. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maya. And I'm sorry, uh, we're just restricted in time. That's why I was cutting. Oh, yeah, okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for those insights. Um, I'll move to my next question, um, uh, Dr. Regessa. Um, competition between livestock farmers, farming, um, traditional farming, and conservation is already a significant significant issue in many parts of the continent. Continent speaking about across Africa, um, especially around northern um, Nigeria and um, areas in uh, East Africa, like in Kenya, like Kipia. Um, what options are available to identify and support sustainable investments um, that drive um, equitable growth and development of the livestock sector um, that can contribute to food and nutrition security and economic development? Sir. 
Sorry, you're muted. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, first I would like to really express again uh, what livestock is to Ethiopia and uh, uh, and how it is going uh, and the plans in the future and where the research is contributing and specifically early in solving those uh, uh, issues. And uh, as you know, Ethiopia is one of the country with biggest livestock resource, uh, but a country which is always complaining about the, the potential is not being used properly. And uh, this is because of the constraints that we always uh, talk about, about the poor genetic makeup, about the uh, health and about the feed issues uh, where it is not really properly managed. So uh, to solve these problems, actually, uh, it should be supported by uh, research. And uh, ILCA was the first international institute to work on livestock. Uh, and it started in Ethiopia and has really uh, contributed a lot, uh, especially in animal disease, in some of the aspects. And finally, uh, it's developed to uh, ILRI, and which is, of course, uh, which operated for the last uh, maybe 44 years or uh, so. Uh, and addressed a lot of uh, issues in Ethiopia and helped us uh, in especially uh, the landmarks of the contribution of Ilri uh, in Ethiopia is the development of livestock uh, master plan, where, of course, we shouldn't always uh, talk about the number of livestock that we have uh, because of many factors that we can't keep increasing the number of uh, large number of livestock. Uh, uh, and uh, we should focus on the productivity of livestock because uh, there are many, many competing uh, agendas in the globe, like the green gas effects, the, like the shrinking of gra grazing land. And also there are many, many uh, other factors which uh, are forcing us to uh, not focus on increased number of livestock, but focus on the production productivity of the, the animals. So in that regard, uh, ILRI has helped us in developing the livestock master plan, which is focusing on improved uh, uh, the genetics, uh, resolve also the issue of uh, widespread animal diseases, and helped us also to intervene the feed shortage issues and helped us also in uh, drafting many uh, policy issues. And now, uh, of course, uh, Ethiopia has uh, drafted its 10 years strategic plan, where uh, again, livestock is one of the major activity uh, that we are uh, uh, sticking to and where we wanted to improve and get benefit from this uh, resource. And again, uh, we based on the livestock master plan that was developed by the help of ILRI to really focus and exploit this resource uh, to the maximum potential. That's why uh, we're really uh, uh, focusing because of there are many competing agendas that uh, we shouldn't really, really go for the large number of livestock, but we are, we are really uh, focusing on increased production and productivity so that the other competing agendas can also be addressed in Ethiopia. So this is one of the uh, major focus areas. And of course, the issues of traditional livestock farming system uh, may not continue as it is. We have to really uh, focus and go uh, on the uh, intensive production system where the other agendas and issues can be uh, resolved. I'm being advised that we only have one minute for the responses that follow from here. So yeah, thank okay, you so much. sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Regessa, um, for those great insights and especially for the great work that's being done in your, con uh, um, in your country and um, you're, you're leading in um, the work that is being done on livestock master plans. So thank you so much for that contribution. Um, I'll finalize, or not finalize, I'll ask two more questions quickly. I'm looking at Shirley so that she can <laughs> give you the green light. Um, I'd like to address this question to um, Dr. Bertram, yeah? We're living through a pandemic right now, and this is reminding us of the threat um, that uh, zoonotic diseases poses. The growing um, human and animal population living closely together 
um, will increase and the chances of uh, novel infections uh, between animal, humans and wild viruses and bacteria um, is quite rampant and we don't know what is in the forefront. Um, how has research in zoonosis impacted the global response to the pandemic? <laughs> And um, what can be done to minimize um, and monitor threats uh, to protect society and the livestock value chain? Great, thanks, Melissa. Well, yes, COVID-19 has bared the vulnerabilities of our global food system and of local food systems. And frankly, one of the reasons that we we're able to develop a vaccine so quickly is that there was a whole group of coronavirus researchers around the world that could stand up quickly, that, that were working quietly below the what we were seeing, but then came together to meet the challenge jointly. So that's a great story about how science delivers. But I think, you know, we heard about the One Health Challenge. Um, it, I, I wish that the agricultural community was as well represented there as it should be. I, I think it is largely driven by human health concerns, and that's understandable, uh, but we have to work doubly hard, those of us in the livestock community, to make sure that that dimension of the One Health, along with environmental health, as Dr. Grace mentioned, with human health, are, are, are brought together equally. A lot of the emphasis is on emerging threats, new unknown threats, which, is, you know, we had COVID-19 as an example of that. But we also know that there's a lot of things we can do that are just good practices in production, in marketing, in, in hygiene, around uh, uh, market systems and uh, livestock uh, uh, trade, et cetera. So there's a lot we already know how to do. And I think we need to, to double down on that. And at the same time, then we can be very cognizant about preventing those opportunities for new and emerging threats to occur, as we've seen a, a number of times just in this century. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, control of animal health in, the, in a development context involves um, the, distinction, the distinction of public and um, private interventions. Um, Dr. Nkwapa. Um, kindly unpack the importance of connecting research institutions to academic and regulatory um, entities to improve applied research and problem solving. Sorry, sir, you're on mute. Yes, thank you very much. Now, uh, the control of... Um, animal health uh, involves two distinct aspects. That is the, the uh, traditional uh, public uh, goods and then the private goods. For example, um, we have certain diseases that normally will be controlled by the government and the government puts money in there. Those are co considered as public goods, diseases like uh, CBPP, PPR and the co, and yet we have some other uh, diseases that nobody will touch. If you want to take care of it, you have to invest, you have to pay for it yourselves. Now, but there have recently emerged a sort of thinning of the line, not knowing really where um, to say the divide is. And what has happened is that we have now come to the realization that what is really missing, the missing link in all this is partnerships. For example, uh, the speakers before talked about One Health. One Health is one great form of partnerships. Working together is partnerships. And now connecting research institutions to the academic and regulatory um, entities is now bringing the universities, which are traditionally considered to be conducting basic research that will be accessible, available to all. And now linking up with the private sector, that uh, with the academia, that is the universities that have access to funding from the private sector, from all sorts of funding areas. And these funders believe that they need to put their money to work for them. These funders believe that you can make money out of research. And this money, um, funders believe that research, when motivated, when fully funded, when equipped, 
can turn out results on time. Now, that is where you have um, synergy and you have good results coming out. I'll give you, uh, for example, over the years, we've had, had quite some researches with um, ILRI, for example, East Coast fever. East Coast fever is a disease that devastates uh, the eastern part of this country. This was considered as a public good. No private sector wants to invest because of the tedious nature of vaccine production. And the disease is not a common disease. It occurs once in two to four years time. So definitely no sector wants to go in. ILRI took it produced the vaccines and handed it over to, uh, Tanzan, uh, to Malawi. Malawi tried to produce the vaccines and failed. Eventually, the Bill and Melinda Gates came with his power as the private sector, put money into it, invested in facilities and equipment, and put this uh, system into work again. Now the, the, the facility is working and we're going through the regulatory agencies to make it work. Now the partnerships. There are fears that when you leave it in the hands of the private, um, private entities, then economic concerns will overtake everything. And the interest of the people of the disease itself will not be concerned. But now bringing in the regulatory authorities to it, they serve as check and balances. So while the, the, the private sector gets what it wants in terms of research, the, 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 the basic traditional government makes available um, these uh, innovations to the people generally and the regulatory authorities control and make sure that there is no abuse and all these things are done according to specifications and standards. Thank you very much. Um, I have one last question. I know Shirley is standing right next to me, but I have to say this, we, just one more. We cannot close without talking about um, the negative press that has been um, given on livestock, especially on the environmental impacts. However, that's only part of the story, not the full story. So as we close panelists, I want you to leave with a bang. Each of you, I would like you to give me with your closing statements, what do you believe member states congregating at COP26 need to put on the agenda as they convene in November? I'll start with you, Dr. Agessa. Two words, I've been told to tell you two words. <laughs> Dr. Agessa, you're on mute, please. For developing countries, life is very difficult without livestock. So any pressure, uh, because the status of the use of livestock and the importance of livestock varies from country. You put yourself on mute again, sorry. Uh -huh. No. It's not from me, I think. Yes, I think there. Uh -huh. Yeah, so life without life developing countries. Uh oh, I'm sorry. We'll have to move to the next um, yeah. person. We'll come back to you. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, Dr. Mkwapa? Okay. The name is Wampa. You, pro you, you pronounce it without the N and without the K, so it sounds Wampa. Okay. Wampa. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that correction. Yes. Now, what I would like uh, to be on the agenda of the COP is, number one, welfare, animal welfare. Number two, uh, sustainability of livestock development in Africa. And possibly number three, issues of conflict, the resolution of conflict with livestock, uh, between livestock herders and the, the, the traditional uh, agriculturists. Thank you. Thank you. Ariana. The farmers are going to COP26 with uh, solutions. Because uh, through an initiative that we call the Climate Makers, a farmer-driven climate change agenda, working closely with CCAP, so with the support of the CJR program on climate, we are finalizing some guidelines on how to improve nationally determined contributions in a win-win-win approach, win for the planet, 
win for the countries that must implement the Paris Agreement and win for the farmers, uh, making sure that their livelihoods will be taken into account. So from our side, what we hope to see is many governments embracing the opportunity of livestock um, uh, through the support of the farmers themselves. Thank you. Dr. Maya. Yeah, so I would like to give the for the COPs the 26 in the two point is the first point I would like to farmer have a to improving the low list and the practice for the healthy life, uh, livestock. And the second, I would like to consumer to eating enough the livestock and the, to keep the uh, good the nutrition. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Bertram. Thanks, Melissa. Two points. One is that agriculture and food systems, the environment and biologic, biological diversity and climate change are all interlinked and need to be solved simultaneously. The second point is that, as I said earlier, we have global challenges, we have local contexts that require different solutions, no one size fits all approaches. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jenny. Thank you so much, Muthoni, and all of the panelists. That was really great and very much appreciated. If you want, please continue to engage in the chat. I've seen some chat saying, can we put our hand up? Can we ask questions? Not today. As I mentioned, we will have another session that launches the book, and you'll have a real chance for lots more interaction, getting into the science there as well. So we've heard about achievements. Investments, time, money, people, and commitments. But we know we're in a fast moving and challenging world. So how do we build on this fantastic work to ensure the potential of sustainable livestock for future food system transformation is realized? I'm gonna be joined by some experts who we've asked to take a look into their crystal balls and share their thoughts on what is needed for that livestock research with the end in mind for food system transformation, climate change, nutrition and health, equitable livelihoods, key issues articulated in the one CGIR research and innovation strategy that refers to transforming food, land and water systems in a climate crisis. Let's hear first from these experts on their views of where livestock research fits in relation to some of these big challenges. So let me welcome first Ian Wright, who is Deputy Director General, Integrated Science at ILRI. Ian, we've heard a lot about what, what research can deliver. We know that this needs to impact on real people, on men, women, young people, and their livelihoods. So what does that mean for livestock research in the future? Thanks, Shirley, and uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Well, we hear a lot about rapid urbanization in Africa and Asia, which of course is true, it's going on. But despite that rapid urbanization, the rural population in Africa and in many parts of Asia is gonna to continue to grow for the next few decades. And agriculture and livestock is gonna to continue to be the major source of employment and livelihoods for millions of people in those rural areas, especially smallholder livestock keepers and all the others involved in livestock value chains. So the challenge for livestock research is to ensure that these millions of people can be competitive, to benefit from the growing demand uh, for livestock products. We had reference to the livestock revolution earlier. So they need to be competitive to benefit from that growing demand. But they have to be competitive also in a way that's equitable and, of course, environmentally sustainable. We've heard a lot about the challenges of the environment, in particular climate change. So this means that livestock research needs to ensure that there is access to markets for these smallholders. It needs to deliver technologies and service delivery models to enhance productivity. Crucially, it needs to understand how women and young people in particular can benefit from livestock value chains. And I would like to draw attention to the fact that there is a whole chapter in the book on gender. And of course, it needs to deliver on ways of reducing the environmental footprint and especially uh, greenhouse gas emissions from livestock. 
Thank you. Sounds like there's still a few things to do. Let's explore that climate angle a little bit more. We have on the line uh, Phil Thornton, Philly's flagship leader for priorities and policies for climate smart agriculture. He's with the CGIR Climate Change and Food Security Program. Phil, as we've heard already, we're used to hearing bad news often about livestock and climate change. We know it's one of those big challenges facing us right now. So how do you see the role of livestock research in the future when it comes to this whole climate change issue? Thank you, Shirley, and hello, everybody. Yes, indeed, the more we seem to learn about the impact of climate change, the worse it seems to get. And if you've perused recent or in press IPCC reports, heat stress becoming more extreme and more widespread, affecting all the domesticated species, changes in pasture species and quality, shifts in disease prevalence and severity, new diseases, water availability, so on and so forth. So, I mean, research is crucial, but I think it's important that we differentiate. As I think Rob just mentioned, one size does, does not fit all. In the higher income countries, it's a lot around mitigation of, of greenhouse gases. Adaptation will still be needed. And particularly, for example, around the costs and benefits of different climate action in livestock systems. Um, there's much that's still unknown and marginal carbon effects, for example, of um, things such as what may be potentially disruptive technologies such as new feedstocks, say alternative protein sources, um, what are the environmental, social, economic impacts of some of those. Whereas in lower income countries, there's something around mitigation, but it's much more around adaptation, given the crucial roles that livestock play with respect to resilience and livelihoods. And generally, just to point out, there's much less information um, than is available for crops, for example. So various things here, making better use of existing genetic variability in breeds and feeds, for example, increasing crop and livestock diversity in farming systems, and making best use of the interlinkages between crops, livestock, and trees, and which have all been shown to increase the buffering capacity, if you like, of, um, of livestock systems. I think even for the higher income and the lower income countries, there are various, a couple of common elements. One is around the effects of climate variability and extremes on livestock systems. We know quite a lot, or we know more about the longer term effects of increased, slowly increasing temperatures, for example. But what about the short term shocks, the, the climate extreme events that can have huge impacts, particularly on livestock systems? And then I think we also need work on the policy and regulatory environments that can promote and support innovation throughout the livestock chains. So there's research needed on how we can design and implement these um, in our pursuit of uh, transforming food systems. Thanks very much, Phil. It's really good the way that some of those things you touched on are things that were already highlighted coming out of the livestock research uh, by our first panel. So that's a, sounds like we're in a good place there. Um, we've heard a bit as well about health, and we also heard right at the beginning about capacity development. So let me welcome Basiru Bonfu, who is Director of the Consortium Afrique One Aspire and Director Emeritus of the Centre Suisse de Recherche Scientifique en Côte d'Ivoire. Basiru, we're all aware, we've heard it already, the importance of having health at the centre of any food system transformation, human, animal, and environment and their connections. So what should be the focus of livestock research in this area? And in particular, what about those capacity di dimensions there that I know you're very passionate about yourself? Yeah, so, thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me. Uh, before I go to your question, I just want to emphasize that we should not mix livestock system because they have different social, economic, and environmental role. And here, uh, I think somebody has uh, raised the legal support uh, to reduce stigmatization of uh, uh, livestock dependent population. So having said that, uh, One Health has been now promoted to make the link between different sectors. But what we uh, lack uh, currently, if I take the example of Africa or West Africa where I'm, I'm working, 
is the lack of skills and training and the capacity building of those who are going to uh, address the one health concept, be it researchers or practitioners, because we are now uh, embarking into one health concept with the old system of training that we have received. We have not been taught on how to have a system thinking, uh, bridging different sectors. And this type of capacity and training is needed in our different uh, research centers and academia, because we need a new generation of researchers to address or to take forward all the, uh, the, the, the outcomes of uh, the research that has been done. And it's very important to have the training. And we see here, for example, in West Africa, how uh, countries are struggling to have epidemiologists or uh, to, 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 to handle outbreaks and uh, uh, to, to, to look at uh, what kind of support can be given to farmers and also the, 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 the policy uh, arena. Another aspect that uh, I think researchers also should, should look uh, is the consumption behavior dynamics. It's very important to, to, to talk about food safety, but nutrition is now uh, a very important aspect that can be handled by uh, the One Health concept. And that determine how we produce and what type of market is ready to take the, the product and who are the future consumers. So to finish, I will say, investment, huge or massive investment is need to build the critical mass of uh, new, uh, uh, new practitioners and new researchers uh, that can address the problem with the transdisciplinary research and working uh, with farmers, with livestock owners and not working for them. Over. Thank you so much for, for highlighting that really crucial capacity issue in this new, terribly interconnected world. Uh, but of course, we've got to eat, and Basira just mentioned the importance of nutrition. So really pleased to have joining us today, Jessica Fanso, who is Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Global po Food Policy and Ethics at the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics, the Bloomberg School of Public Health. So we've got to eat. How do we ensure that livestock research priorities do really contribute to better food and nutrition for healthy and well-nourished people worldwide? Jessica, your thoughts on that? Great, thank you so much, Shirley. And, and it's really nice to be with ILRI colleagues. Um, you all work on a critically important agenda and I'm really pleased to be here. So thinking about the role of livestock in delivering healthy and sustainable diets, this is a very polarized and fractious debate. Um, many questions are arising around alternative proteins like lab and cultured meats and use of other fermentation technology. Will that replace traditional forms of livestock production, both intensive and extensive systems? And is that the best way to move towards sustainable diets from a health perspective? This probably won't happen anytime soon if one takes a more uh, localized perspective. And while the science of animal source foods on diets and nutrition is quite nuanced, there's a lot of consensus that binds us, more so than controversy, controversy surrounding the debates. So I'm gonna highlight just a couple of things. One, there's recognition that more plants, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, legumes, in diets are required in some parts of the world, like Europe, North America. And in some countries, in parts of Africa, for example, livestock consumption will need to increase to meet the nutritional needs of the poorest and most vulnerable. So it's really a matter of equity. We need to push high income countries that are consuming a lot of meat more than they need to, to lower their meat consumption through a range of hard and soft policies. And we need to spur innovation for countries that just don't get enough of animal source foods. And from 
the nutrition perspective, why, why are livestock foods and other animal source foods so important? Well, they're a significant source and the only dietary source of vitamin B12 and D, which are often lacking in diets globally, as well as omega-3 fatty acids like DHA and EPA. They contain higher densities of more bio, bioavailable forms of zinc, iron, and vitamin A, often also lacking in diets globally as compared to plant source foods. And there's a lot of unique compounds found in, in meat, CLA, uh, creatine, carnosine, taurine that play roles in health. And we don't totally understand uh, those uh, different compounds completely. Now, one of the biggest contributors to disease and death more so is probably these highly processed foods or what's called ultra processed foods that are very high in added sugars, salt, and unhealthy fats. And that needs to be more of a focus because there's a huge growth in movement of these ultra processed foods around the world. And a lot of data is coming out on their detrimental impacts to morbidity and mortality. On the overconsumption side, processed meat is associated associated with increased risk of cancer on average, although the precise mechanisms and differences between subtypes of cancer and the types of meats and how they're curated require more study. And red meat consumption, there is a, a, some adverse health effects, but only when consumed at very high amounts, um, exceeding uh, more than three servings a week, which is consistent with the national dietary guidelines of most countries. So uh, largely this is, is agreed upon by the nutrition community, but the question is really about equity and how do we make policy recommendations based on localized, contextualized public health needs and less about global aggregation and uniformity. And I'll end there. Thanks a lot, Shirley. Thanks very much, Jessica. You've given us a breadth from details of nutrition right through to changing mindsets and behaviors and perhaps everything in between as well. And indeed, we've heard from all our panelists a very wide range of opportunities for livestock research to contribute to those future food systems that we're all aspiring to. Fantastic insights. Thank you all very much. I'd like to pick up on something that, that Delia mentioned in the earlier panel. Delia said, we've done the, uh, the easy things. So panel members, I'm gonna give you each one sentence now. Um, and I want to hear from you, give us something to think about and hopefully act on. What's your call to action? That one thing that we really must do, Ian. Okay, thanks, Shelley. Um, we heard at the beginning of this session from Jonathan, Jonathan Wordsworth, that, Wordsworth, that, that uh, livestock accounts for about 40% of agricultural GDP on average. But if you look at the investment in livestock, it gets a miserable 5% of agricultural investment. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about official development assistance or expenditure at the national level. It's about 5%. So my call to action is to support advocacy for much greater investment in livestock, including in the CGIR, using the sound evidence base that we have that shows how greater investments is essential to achieving the sort of food systems transformation that Jessica has mentioned, to achieving the sustainable development goals, to both capitalize on the opportunities, but also deal with the real challenges that we have in the livestock sector. And in doing this, low and middle income countries should not be bullied by some voices from the global north who advocate against livestock. Thank you. Phil? Thanks, Shelley. I think in addition to massively increased investment, in terms of how we actually can allocate resources, we've heard a lot about integration and the systems approach. I think this is absolutely critical. And so promoting a livestock research for, de for development environment that can really integrate across sectors. So the crop, livestock, water, disaster risk reduction, climate security and health. We all have things that we can learn from each other. 
and also in this enabling environment that can enable in innovation at different scales and throughout livestock value chains. There's huge potential for technological, economic and social innovations that can be truly powerful forces for helping to transform our food systems. Thank you. Basiru. Yeah, thank you. I will emphasize again on the, not maybe on capacity alone, but the performance of uh, veterinary services in our countries, because now uh, evidence show that uh, with the losses due to conflict, due to drug or uh, uh, epidemics, uh, there are a lot of problem of mental health of uh, livestock dependent population is and it's one of the key issue we need also to address with increasing the, cap uh, the capacity and the performance of uh, uh, veterinary services, especially, for example, in the meat inspection where we lack uh, resources to handle uh, food safety uh, problem. Over. Thank you. Thanks. Jessica, last word to you. From my perspective, just really considering equity in everything that we do, um, and it's a bit to Ian's point, energy intensive lifestyles, dietary choices of those living in high income countries are significant anthropogenic contributors to climate change. And we know that economically poor households are likely to experience uh, a disproportionate burden of the impacts of climate change. Diet is part of that. And so we need to be thinking about who needs to make bigger changes to their diets um, in what I would call, we are all in this together kind of problem, that being climate change. And, and, um, and that's uh, something that I hope high income countries particularly can start thinking about. Thank you, excellent. Thank you all, great panel. Many challenges, many opportunities, but we've also heard huge amount of research and well-positioned research going into the future. We're in a good place. So um, with that, I'm gonna conclude here. I'm gonna hand over to Jimmy for some concluding remarks. Um, and just to mention again, we will have an official launch of the book where there will be a bit more time to get into some of the science details that I know many of you online have been itching to get into. So, so watch this space for that. Thanks again to the World Bank for hosting us. Jimmy, back to you to conclude. Thank you, Shirley. Ladies and gentlemen, I trust that you have found these three panel sessions useful to you as you consider the impacts of the work in this book and how you might put it to use. I wanna thank all the panelists for their contributions today. We will continue the efforts to make this book known and used as we advance future research on livestock. As, a, as has already been mentioned, we have included in the book and was the subject of the last panel, a chapter on the future of livestock research and how those contributions can make the livestock sector in the developing countries more economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable. This agenda is necessarily broad, and while time will not allow me to get into the specifics of it here, I must mention that it must continue to address, as we concluded today, some of the controversies in which the sector is currently embroiled, particularly that of livestock and the environment and climate change specifically. Of course, some of the controversies are driven by misleading information and sometimes false information and broad generalizations from one place to another. Rob mentioned the need for local specificity and local solutions. However, it is true that in the context of climate change, livestock is a contributor and it must do its share. There are several things we can do in this regard. High emission intensities of livestock products from ruminants in particular can be vastly reduced in the developing world by increasing productivity. If we were to increase productivity of livestock, we will need fewer animals to meet the growing demands for animal source foods and therefore cut emissions. As we know, 
Rangelands make up more than 50% of the terrestrial surface and mostly used for livestock. With appropriate management, these rangelands can become carbon sinks as significant as forests are. But as important as the climate issue is, we also must be balanced in our approach to attempt to address some other areas. The current pandemic, likely of zoonotic origin, is a reminder that we must devote research attention to preventing and controlling such diseases using a One Health approach, even as we continue to address food safety and AMR and such other issues. As Ian already mentioned, we need the continued support of our funders and increasing help from them. He mentioned the proportion of contribution to GDP of livestock, but the share of the investment it gets. We must improve this. But a small center in the CGIR with such a big agenda cannot do it all its own. Partnerships are key. We will continue to forge partnerships, build on the ones we have and forge new ones in the R&D research institutions continuum, north and south, south-south, up and downstream. Ladies and gentlemen, I must again thank you for your interest and participation today and look forward to continuing to work with you in the future, not only to tackle the challenges, but to capitalize on the opportunities that the livestock sector offer. So thank you again for your interest and participation. And let me say at this stage, good morning, good evening, good night from wherever you have joined. Thank you and good, goodbye.